Hi, everybody. Welcome to Big Joe's Journal. My name is Joe Tilden. I'm the host of this program. Well, here we are in uh, June. Maybe summer's here. It's warming up a little bit. The uh, Forest and Parks people are telling us that uh, it's still rather risky to go hiking up in the uh, upper highlands, that uh, in some cases there's still snow, and that many of the trails up there are still rather muddy. And of course, this was emphasized by a landslide they had up at uh, Mount Mansfield about a week ago, which uh, closed off uh, a couple of the hiking trails up there. And also, uh, for folks that uh, want to get in the water, Lake Champlain, Lake Bomazine, Lake St. Catherine, some of our other lakes, uh, they're saying now that it's still a little bit too cold. You go in swimming, you're taking a calculated risk, and there's a possibility to get hypothermia. This water still has not warmed up where it should be for this time of year. So summer is here. Most of it is here. Uh, some of it is still to come. Those of you that get Time Magazine, when you get your Time Magazine this week, take a good look at the cover. And on the cover is our old friend, Senator Bernie Sanders. And the feature story, this week's Time Magazine, is the rebooted Sanders campaign for the presidency. And that picture on the cover of Time, um, they must have had a makeup artist from, uh, for some, from some funeral home step in, because Bernie looks a lot younger on the cover than he appears to be in real life. But it's obvious Bernie's getting a lot of attention the second time around. Uh, he is second choice to the former Vice President Joe Biden 24 people seeking the Democratic nomination. And it'll be interesting when the uh, political debates begin, how they're going to cut them down. The Democrats have arranged a two-tier debate system when all 24 will be on. But as we know, through the uh, primary system, um, first of all, out in Iowa, where you have the local caucuses, and in New Hampshire, the first primary in the nation, uh, California has moved their primary up, so that's going to be a big one in March. And of course, South Carolina is a major primary. But once you get into Iowa, New Hampshire, South Carolina, you're going to see that field of 24 dwindle down. I'd say it'll probably dwindle down the first time out, the first cut. I'd say it'll probably dwindle down around uh, 17 or 18. And then as the process continues, it's going to dwindle down even more. Eventually, you're going to wind up with potentially maybe four to six candidates in the running going right up to the convention. Former Vice President Joe Biden, certainly Bernie Sanders, and Bernie is, um, I would say he's sort of a political miracle of one kind or another. You know, when Bernie first came here, it was part of the uh, Back to Earth movement with all the hippies and everything moving into Vermont. And the primary area that they moved into was down to Wyndham County, down around Brattleboro and Bellis Falls. And I know I was living in Bellis Falls in the late 60s. And um, there was a major question for the school board in Brattleboro. As many of the kids who were going to Brattleboro were adopting the, uh, the hippie attitude and the hippie, hippie look of the long hair. And the question came up with Brattleboro High School's boys basketball team. Should they be allowed to play basketball with long hair? And this was a very serious question at the time. And uh, I remember one of the members saying, or somebody brought up the thing, well, you can't tell the boys from the girls anymore. And a number of members of the board said, well, as long as the boys and girls can tell the difference, that's all that counts. Well, another question, you know, can they play basketball as well with long hair as they can with the crew cuts and all that sort of thing? Well, of course, they eventually decided that this was a question and the Rattleboro School Board dropped it and so did the headmasters. Now, Bert Sanders came into uh, Brattleboro Coming back to the land, um, 
Bernie divorced his first wife, and he ran for office, and he couldn't buy a win. He ran for Congress, and he got beat. He ran for the U.S. Senate, and he got beat. He ran for governor two or three times, and he got clobbered. And then, for whatever reason, he decided to leave the Liberty Union Party. He was one of the leaders in the Liberty Union Party, he and Peter Diamond Stone, who was an attorney down in Brattleboro and still is very active in the Liberty Union. But Bernie decided to take his uh, Liberty Union policy and go from Brattleboro to Burlington. And he organized another political party in Burlington called the Progressive Party. And as at that time the only candidate on the progressive ticket, he ran for mayor of Burlington and surprisingly he was elected the mayor of Burlington by 12 votes. Well, they had a recount, still was 12 votes. Bernie was the mayor. And everybody said, wow, what's going to happen? Here we've got a hippie in our, as our mayor here. What's going to happen? Well, with Bernie as mayor, Burlington became very, very, very progressive. They had a lot of activities in Burlington that they hadn't had before. You had the annual jazz festival, which just concluded in Burlington. It runs for a week in the first part of June. They have the choo-choo, which is uh, not C-H-O-O, -O, but C-H-E-W, C-H-E-W. And this is a, a food festival. The farmers' markets increased in the Burlington area. Um, Burlington got a minor league baseball team. And they still have it, you know, the so-called Lake Monsters. When Bernie was there, the Lake Monsters were a farm team of the Cincinnati Reds. They are now a farm team of the Oakland A's. Well, no, I'm sorry, when they first started, they were a farm team of the uh, then Montreal Expos, or now the Washington Nationals. And once the Expos moved to Washington, D.C., the Lake Monsters became a farm team of the Cincinnati Reds. And they are now a farm team, of course, of the Oakland A's, and their season will be beginning on the 14th of June, just around the corner. They play at Centennial Field in Burlington. And a lot of money has gone into updating Centennial Field and making it more modern and making it uh, much more receptive to hosting minor league baseball for guys that are, that are beginning their major league baseball career and, and hoping to uh, have a future in the big leagues. And a few of... Um, the folks that have played for the Lake Monsters have got onto the big leagues. Uh, one in particular was Bernie Carbo, who uh, was one of the, uh, well, he was actually one of the Cincinnati heroes back in 1975 when the Cincinnati Reds defeated the uh, Red Sox in the World Series. So Bernie has now become virtually unbeatable. He's gone from not being able to win and not being able to buy a win being virtually unbeatable. He went from being the mayor of Burlington, he organized the Progressive Party that now has a number of um, candidates, certainly one of them is our lieutenant governor, who will probably be running for governor in another year or so. Um, Bernie himself, his career moved on, he remarried. And um, he married, he married a girl by the name of Jane Curtis. Well, Bernie ran as an independent, and his first time out, when he ran for Congress, he was defeated again. But he ran again and was elected, elected overwhelmingly, and since then, he's been unbeatable. He went from being our congressman, running as an independent, and when Senator uh, Jim Jeffords retired, he ran for Jeffords' seat and was successful. And now he has decided that he's going to call himself a progressive Democrat, even though he's not a member of the Democratic Party. He's listed as an independent from Vermont. But he is doing what uh, was unthinkable a few years ago. 
going after the Democratic nomination. 2016, he uh, sought the Democratic nomination. He was opposed by the powers that be of the Democratic Party. The uh, leadership of the Democratic Party very mistakenly were determined that the nominee was going to be Hillary Clinton. She can't lose. Well, what they didn't look at was the fact that nobody really liked Hillary. For whatever reason, Hillary has a habit of turning people off. You don't know whether she's telling you the truth or not. But they felt that she had a chance. If the Republicans nominated Donald Trump, they figured she'd be in. If the Republicans are, not, are dumb enough to nominate an idiot like Donald Trump, then anybody could beat him. Even Mickey Mouse. Well, that was the thinking at the time. But as the lead candidate, Hillary ran a terrible campaign. They should have looked at Hillary's history where she starts off great and then blows it at the end. Back when Bill Clinton tried to uh, put in a nationwide health care program, he nominated his wife, the First Lady, Hillary Clinton, as a champion of that. And of course, she blew it. And uh, in 2008, she was the leading candidate for the Democratic nomination. There was a junior senator from Illinois, a tall, skinny fellow with big ears, by the name of Barack Obama. He's trying to campaign, really. Nobody thought, said, well, it's nice he's challenging, but he'll never be the nominee. Well, of course, again, Hillary messed up. Obama became the nominee and became the first African-American to be elected president of the United States. And he picked as his running mate a man who had great experience in the legislative branch, the senior senator from Delaware by the name of Joe Biden. And the Obama-Biden ticket for eight years pulled the country out of a very, what would have been a very, very serious, I won't call it a recession, but a depression. Their policies weren't greeted with 100% by most people, but they worked. And the country did not go into a depression, but bounced back. And this prosperity that the current occupant of the White House tries to claim credit for was begun by his predecessor. And it's his predecessor's policies that are fueling this economic comeback. The current incumbent of the White House is adopting policies that are going to end it and send us into one wicked recession and probably a very deep depression if he's there much longer. Well, getting back to Bernie Sanders, it boiled down to Bernie and Hillary, and of course Hillary had the support of the Democratic leadership and she was the nominee. And Bernie did campaign for her. It was a, shouldn't have been a better experience for him. I mean, he wasn't a Democrat to begin with and he did very well and almost being the nominee of the Democratic Party. But Bernie never gives up. He never gives up. You got to give him credit for that. And so here he is again, once again, seeking the Democratic nomination. He's calling himself a socialist Democrat. And uh, right now in the overall polls, of course, he is second to former Vice President Joe Biden. Well, I think as the, these primaries and other things take place, and this field of 24 gets weeded down, if you will, I'm going to take a wild guess, and of course, the, it'll be Biden, it'll be Sanders, it'll be the junior senator from California, Senator Harris, who is female, African-American, which shows how the country is changing for the better. Uh, another possibility being in there is a junior senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker, the former congressman from Texas, Beto O'Rourke. And if I were picking the Democratic candidate, and I am a member of the Democratic National Committee, 
But if I had going to have any kind of influence at all, I would look at two possibilities. First of all, a ticket of Joe Biden and Beta O'Rourke. I think that would be a fabulous ticket. Another fabulous ticket would be the junior senator from New Jersey, Corey, Corey Hooker from New Jersey, and also Beta O'Rourke as vice president. Mr. O'Rourke has an awful lot of energy, and he's a tremendous campaigner. And I think a ticket of Biden and O'Rourke, or the senator from New Jersey, Cory Booker and O'Rourke, um, it brings youth, it brings energy, which the country needs right now. I'm a fine one to talk about that, being a senior citizen headed into my mid-80s, or in my mid-80s. But I think a young energetic ticket that is going to campaign energetically and campaign in every state, not just a few selected ones, as the last campaign did, and ignored some states that had voted Democratic for years. When they were ignored, all of a sudden they switched and went the other way. And we had a major upset in 2016, one of the biggest upsets that the electorate in the United States has ever made. Granted, Hillary won the popular vote, but it's the electoral vote that counts. And so he can crow all he wants, but he was a minority president, even though he won the Electoral College, as was George W. Bush. So Bernie, flying high right now, on the cover of Time, which at one time used to be considered a uh, very great honor to make the cover of Time. And Bernie has done that. So congratulations on that. I'm looking forward to reading the story about uh, Bernie's comeback, although I don't see it as a comeback. I think he's, his comeback came when he was elected mayor of Burlington, and it's been full steam ahead ever since then. And see what uh, the good folks have to say about Bernie and what his chances are. I think his chances are very good. But I think when you get right down to it, the Democrats have got to beat Donald Trump. That's the bottom line. You know, now they're talking about impeachment. Well, you know, folks, where uh, it's less than a year and a half before we elect a new president. And I think rather than waste your time on impeachment in the House, it's the Senate that will convict. And a Republican Senate will never convict Donald Trump. As long as Mitch McConnell is there, the horse is ass from Kentucky, Donald Trump will never be convicted in the Senate. So I think if you're going with impeachment, you're wasting your time. I'd concentrate on the elections of November 2020. And let's get a ticket that can win. And let's run a campaign that can win. And a campaign that is going to cover. As Howard Dean used to say when he was the chairman of the Democratic National Committee, going to cover every zip code in the United States and its possessions. It's the only way you win. It's the only way you're going to win. Many people in the labor movement, they believe Trump's lies when he's going to bring back the steel industry, going to put the Rust Belt back to work. Well, of course, it never happened and under Trump. It never would happen. Trump was lying through his teeth as usual. Unfortunately, too many people fell for those lies state of Pennsylvania uh, came out for Trump and said, hey, around Pittsburgh, he's going to put us back to work. Well, never happened, never will happen. So a very good chance that a strong Democratic ticket that campaigned in every state is going to win back some of those states that normally voted Democratic but weren't Republican last time, like Pennsylvania, like Michigan like Wisconsin, like Missouri, bring him back in the Democratic column, and we'll have a new president, either Joe Biden, who, will, who if he is the nominee and is elected, will be the oldest 
president ever to take office, and so will Bernie Sanders if he's the nominee and he is elected. But I think speaking of Bernie, I think many of his policies are too far to the left for a lot of people to swallow. Uh, free college, questionable. One thing I think we as adults know and are well aware of, nothing in life is free. Somebody's going to pay for it. And when you talk about free college and free this and free that, you have to wonder, well, who's going to pick up the tab? Who's going to pay for it? Somebody is going to pay for it. Chances are, if you say, well, the government's going to pay for it, well, how is the government going to do it? By raising taxes. The only way they can. The government right now, with the tax cuts that this current administration has put in, people are saying, ah, that's good. But our deficit grows by billions. And somewhere, someplace down the line, some generation is going to have to pay for that. And they're going to see a tax hike. And I'm sure the president that proposes the tax hike is going to be very, very unpopular. But folks, you know, in your household, you have to pay your bills. The government's the same way. The government has to pay its bills. And so when we look at our presidential candidates and we look at Bernie and we talk about this free thing and that free thing, the bottom line is somebody's going to pay, and who is it? Who's going to pay the bill? But that aside, you know, it's great to see uh, our junior senator on the cover of Time magazine, and I'm sure it'll be interesting reading all about Bernie and his career, which is, it's a history, really, here in the United States. The guy that came in as a long-haired hippie he hasn't got that much hair anymore, because he's gray-haired, um, couldn't buy an election victory, and all of a sudden he turns it around, and in Vermont he's unbeatable. And he's making a very, very strong showing on the national front. Um, very interesting reading, a most unusual figure in American history. And Bernie Sanders has established himself as a important character or a very interesting character in the history of the United States of America. Well, speaking of the history of the United States of America, as you know, last week we celebrated the 75th anniversary of D-Day, which was the Allied invasion of France. In other words, the Allied sea assault on what Hitler called Fortress Europe. And a very, very bloody day for the American military. The number of casualties that they took, and really a miracle that the invasion succeeded at all. But it did succeed. And it brought down a crumbling Third Reich. Hitler boasted he was establishing a Third Reich would last for a thousand years. Well, it only lasted about six years, if you will. Europe devastated. So many people lost their lives, their livelihood. Uh, one of the greatest tragedies in world history. But we also remember our heroes, the greatest generation. And it was rather interesting, some of the old veterans that went back to commemorate the 75th anniversary, it's probably the last time they'll go there, all in their 90s. One fellow was a paratrooper, 97 years old, had a ceremonial jump to reenact his, uh, when he parachuted in to Cherbourg, just outside of Normandy. The idea was to keep German reinforcements from coming up to the front to help the infantry that was landing on the beaches uh, gain a foothold and move in. 
And he talked about that. He was greeted as a hero over there. The other old veterans in their 90s, well, chances are they won't be around. We're almost pretty sure that they're not going to be around for the 100th. In fact, there'll be nobody around at that time that will remember D-Day. They'll remember reading about it and hearing about it, but no one will have been alive at that particular time. And it was interesting that I was watching the series on TV that of all the military leaders, or political leaders, I should say, that spoke at that ceremony, none of them were alive when D-Day took place. Our, uh, well, I won't call him our leader, but he was over there, and, and for once in his life, he gave a halfway decent speech that was written, obviously, by somebody else. But his, his ancestors at the time were on the other side. Trump's grandparents were refugees from Germany. So I'm sure he had some relatives that uh, were serving in the German military. There's another incident that I was watching on Discovery TV. There's a rumor in Poland that toward the end of the war, the German leaders wanted to save much of the gold and jewelry and everything that they had stolen from these other countries. So they put it on a railroad car and they used inmates at their, uh, their imprisonment camps to dig these tunnels deep in the earth. And they laid railroad tracks down there. And the rumor is that there is a railroad car, presumably a passenger car, that is buried in one of those tunnels that is full of gold. Now, of course, there have been a lot of rumors about gold here, there, and everywhere. But a search has been on, and it's, it's sort of taken on added credence as people have explored some of these old tunnels which haven't been used or entered since the end of World War II. And now people are beginning to explore more and more. And they're seeing where some of these tunnels had railroad tracks. And where do they lead to? And how deep in the earth do they go? Well, the word is that that uh, car that the Nazis loaded with gold is still underground there somewhere. Uh, it's gone from being a car to being a train. But some of the tunnels that these people are exploring, they have railroad tracks. And it's a possibility that they could have used an engine and pushed a car in there down as far as it'll go and then sealed off the area. But whether anyone ever finds it, well, that'll be interesting if they ever do. But the search is on. Um, and these tunnels, of course, are being explored. I think watching it, the thing that impressed me was the way they were able to take the slave labor and they, they held these people in the worst of conditions, inhumane, inhumane, absolutely, and forced them to work and to dig those tunnels underground. You have to wonder how many died doing it. Just another sign of Nazi cruelty, but also brilliance. And it's too bad that that intellectual capacity, that brilliant capacity that Nazi Germany had could not have been used in an entirely different direction. Rather than destroying the world and destroying a nation, it could be used to build up, build up a nation, build up a continent. A lot of uh, geniuses have come out of Nazi Germany. Werner von Braun, who was the driving force behind the V-1 and V-2 rockets that devastated London at the end of the war, was taken by the United States and more or less the, the brains behind our space program. In Great Britain, they wanted to put him to death because of the destruction and death that the V-1 and V-2 had caused. Also, at the end of the war, Germany invented the jet plane. But we'll talk about that on another day. So with that, may Almighty God and his infinite wisdom continue to bless these United States of America. God love you. We'll see you all next week.